the past two years have been difficult ones for many countries around the world. And as there was some hope of recovery picking up as we learned to live with COVID-19, Russia's invasion of Ukraine exacerbated the issues many economies were facing. This brought with it renewed supply chain disruptions affecting the energy mix, food supplies, and even the global value chain. Now across the continent, we have witnessed a drastic rise in basic food supplies, raw materials, and fuel. We've also seen African countries either starting conversations around increasing the minimum wage or going ahead to do so so citizens can cope with the rising cost of living. Kenya and Morocco are two countries who increased the minimum wage to give workers, as they've said, a buffer against this increased cost of living. And now Tanzania has also decided to increase wages for workers by 23.3%. The last pay rise for civil servants in the country was seven years ago. And while workers rejoice at the news, there's also the conversation around the East African crude oil pipeline, as well as the country's plan for electricity generation. Today, we start with a look at Tanzania increasing workers' wages. This is Business Edge. I'm Tolulope Adileru Valogun. And joining me from Nairobi, Kenya, is Ali Khan Sachu, Africa geoeconomist, macro analyst, and the CEO of Rich Management. Ali Khan, it's good to see you again. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. Pleasure, pleasure to be with you. So let's start with this. Now, the upward review of worker salaries, we've seen the developments in Kenya and Morocco in recent times. And now uh, the president, Samia Saluhu Hassan, has announced uh, at the May Day celebration that Tanzanian public uh, civil servants will be seeing a 23.3% increase. The last time that there was a salary increase was seven years ago. Why was that? Why has it taken so long for this to now happen again in Tanzania? So um, you're completely right. It's been a very long, long time, this adjustment, um, seven years to be exact. I think, you know, under the previous regime of President Magapuli, um, he was highly skeptical about uh, civil service productivity. Um, he was quite aggressive in trying to increase that. You'll remember visits to um, uh, all kinds of ministries and uh, uh, public haranguing of officials. So, um, you know, there was, there, there was that specific uh, scenario. And I think uh, the president here is playing catch up, um, uh, understands that there's been significant slippage in, in earnings for, for the civil service. And it's a smart move politically as well. Um, uh, and I think it's got to be seen in that context. Overall, inflation in Tanzania um, has been relatively better behaved than other African countries because of the very strong agricultural and food production sector, which keeps a lid on food prices. But this was long overdue. And, uh, you know, the president continues to make smart moves um, of course, there will be a challenge around affordability, yeah. but uh, I think that that will be within the envelope of expectations. And in terms of expectations, we've heard from the Tanzanian Trade Union Congress, which they had actually asked for a higher amount, but they said they were very happy with the president. This is something that she had committed to uh, since last year, and now she's making it happen. So government has agreed to a 23.3% increase. How does this number work compared to what the union was asking for? And in terms of arriving at this 23.3, it could have been 20, it could have been 25, it could have been 24. What's sort of the conditions around uh, what informed the number? What do you think? I think what informed the number was seven years um, of inflation a calculation taken on that basis and a desire to make uh, uh, the civil servants whole versus that seven-year uh, scenario. And I think that's what's informed the calculation. Um, obviously, politically speaking, you don't want to cave in to the full amount. I think this is more than reasonable, and that's why the trade unions accepted it. Um, it's not often you find trade unions accepting uh, what they're given. And I think this confirms that this was a fair and equitable number, um, given the context of, of the adjustment. 
All right, so let's get to that funding uh, question. So stay with me now. So as a result of this increment, the government plans to spend about 9.7 trillion uh, Tanzanian shillings to pay salaries of civil servants in the central government, local government institutions, and of course, government agencies. Now, the new increment is expected to cost Tanzania some 1.5 trillion uh, Tanzanian shillings per year, equivalent to 19.51% of its budget for the 2021-2022 um, financial year. How is Tanzania expected to fund this? Because it also feels like they're going to have to move some money around right now to even make up for uh, the increment that's going to be given as of right now before they start projections against future financial years. So you're, com you're completely correct. I mean, you know, Tanzania has a big appetite for infrastructure spending. They're, they're putting on a lot of capex on that balance sheet. Um, uh, there has been some quite expensive borrowing also, which they're now recalibrating by returning to the multilaterals, for example. So I think, you know, yes, they're, you know, they're going to have to find this money from somewhere. It's not going to be easy. Um, but I think, you know, given the interest savings that they are projecting on their overall borrowing, I think they'll be able to find this cash. Um, and, you know, you, you're completely correct. Uh, this is going to boost the recurrent expenditure um, part of the budget quite dramatically. 19% uh, is no small number for an overall budget increase. But I think, you know, it's politically makes sense and economically um, uh, they will be able to pay for it. I don't think um, we're talking about anything reckless. We're talking about uh, an equitable adjustment for the government sector. So how much of this money do you think is also going to move around the economy? Because I know that also comes into consideration when we look at increasing public servants' uh, wages in terms of having more money move around the economy, uh, go to people who are selling things, go to people buying things, buying houses, buying, um, building homes for themselves, so that it circulates around as well. So in terms of this being an increment for the civil servants, how do you think it also either benefits or affects the economy as it may be? You're talking about circulation, velocity, and, and hopefully some trickle-down. And I think uh, uh, definitely you're going to see all those three things happen. Um, uh, the economy has not been doing badly. It's been doing relatively well. It's very resilient. and it has, It's got a lot of potential uh, going forward in the context of the new economy that we're looking at. They've got gas. They've got a lot of minerals that they want to unlock. Um, uh, you know, there is a lot of potential in this economy, but going to your point about will this money circulate, of course it will. Um, uh, people tend to spend their salaries on all kinds of things. So yes, I think it will create uh, a boost and there will be a multiplier effect uh, on the economy as well. Now, some analysts have said that the increments will force the government to look for more sources of revenue and particularly for the next financial year, a larger portion of the budget will have to go to salaries, means that the efforts for more revenue and different sources will, be, uh, will have to be intensified. Do you agree with them? Do you think that this is going to force Tanzania to start looking for more ways, particularly to make money beyond, of course, controlling the borrowing and the agricultural sector and, of course, tourism? That is quite big for them, as we've said. So, yes, this is the perennial challenge for African governments is raising uh, revenue and raising uh, revenue versus GDP. I think, you know, the Tanzanian government will probably allow some oxygen and uh, given the context, you know, we're all emerging from the COVID situation. We've got this uh, new environment with the Ukrainian situation, which is another whammy on the economy. So I suspect they're going to soft pedal on raising revenue immediately and see if they can sort of plug the gap uh, through cheaper financing and other things. But in the medium term, yes, they're going to have to raise revenue um, uh, in order to finance uh, this expansion of, of the budget. There is no doubt about that. Um, if I'm going to critique the government, I would say there have been some knee-jerk reactions, uh, re re revenue-raising reactions. You remember the mobile money um, uh, and a couple of other decisions like that, which I did not agree with. I think um, uh, 
those were uh, short sighted. They, you know, you things like mobile money. You want to encourage velocity, and then if you allow that to happen, you're going to collect more money anyway. So I would, if I'm going to critique the government, I would say, you know, they have sometimes. Uh, responded in a knee-jerk manner in terms of revenue raising without thinking it all through. But I think they've got enough room. I think there's enough potential. I think the president has led this charge to re-engage with the international community. And all of that is going to produce uh, significant uh, economic benefits uh, for the, the way the balance sheet, the government's balance sheet is being managed. All right, so Ali Khan, we're going to take a break. The wage increase is not the only thing happening in Tanzania. We also need to look at what's happening around the controversy surrounding the African, the East African crude oil pipeline and touch on the country's plans for electricity generation. The conversation will continue after this. And still with me is Ali Khan Sachu, Africa geoeconomist and macro analyst as we look at Tanzania increasing wages and now going on to some other issues happening in the country. Now, Germany's largest lender, Deutsche Bank, has reportedly denied financing the planned $3.5 billion East African crude oil pipeline, which would stretch more than 1,400 kilometers from Uganda to Tanzania. So let me bring Ali Khan back in here. In terms of the project status, where are we on this project, particularly for the crude oil pipeline, and as well as this funding gap? Who do you think is going to be able to step into it? And has Deutsch come out to say um, affirmatively that they are no longer part of this project? So, so firstly, to your point about Deutsche Bank, they haven't made an official statement I had seen. I saw the report earlier this morning, but it seems that the bank itself um, ha has not made an official statement to the effect that was being reported. So I, I would prefer to wait for that. Obviously, you know, we've seen significant challenges around oil and gas um, investments, and in part that's what's driven the oil, oil and gas prices higher because of concerns around uh, carbon and all, all of that kind of thing. Um, uh, people are not making these capex expenditures, and there's been a significant push from civil society also um, to try and uh, stop this pipeline. However, I think uh, uh, well, uh, you know that there is money available for it. I know Vincent Bolloré, who is a French entrepreneur who operates a lot in West Africa, has spoken about giving logistical support to this pipeline. I suspect, you know, that uh, Total would be able, for example, to fund it um, if they needed to at a push um, and put together a consortium of banks. So I'm not as skeptical as some people are around uh, funding of this pipeline. I expect it to happen. Um, uh, I just think uh, it's all playing out in the public domain, the, the push, and, push and shove around it. But definitely, I expect it to happen. I think it's too important for both governments and also for the, the big investors, the operators um, like Total, amongst others. So I, I find it interesting. So we're seeing the movement around this pipeline in East Africa, the conversation around um, the pipeline in West Africa, conversations around gas pipelines. And then there's also that pressure um, that the Russia-Ukraine war has brought to it with Europe looking to ban crude oil and um, gas imports from Russia as well. How does all of that play out together, particularly in terms of the timelines, the deadlines, the people who are going to get involved in these particular projects across the continent? Ali Khan? Okay, I think there is a network issue there. But as I said, a number of these pipelines or pipeline projects now being spread out across the continent. And Tanzania's own is just one of those. I do think I have Ali Khan back with me. Ali Khan, are you back? Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. I missed uh, your earlier question. No I problem. Apologize. Okay, so the question is, we've seen this pipeline in the East Africa. We've seen what's going on in West Africa as well. We've heard the gas pipelines, all of that. And then, of course, the, Rus the pressure with Russia and Ukraine in terms of looking for Europe looking for other sources of energy for their use. 
how does all of this play out for African countries? And then he goes again. All right, so we will be seeing how we can make sure we wrap the conversation up with my guests in just a bit. Let's take a quick time out and then business as you'll continue. And I think we'll be able to manage to get an answer from Ali Khan now. So I won't repeat the question. You've caught it. So where do you think all of this is going for the African countries involved in particular, and even with Tanzania as well? So, you know, we've had this big drive by the Europeans to try and dilute the influence of Russia by reducing the dependency of European countries on Russian oil and gas. So that's a big push now, um, and a lot of the European countries are looking at Africa. For example, Draghi was visiting not too long ago, amongst others. So I see uh, this, uh, this major geoeconomic shift where Europe is trying to shift its uh, uh, demand curve away from Russia as favoring um, oil and gas in Africa. And therefore, I think uh, whether it's Mozambique or whether it's Tanzania, um, uh, you're going to see significant push to get these projects off the ground. Um, and therefore, you know, I'm quite optimistic uh, that uh, this particular pipeline is going to happen. Um, I think there, there's some serious wins in the sales of African oil and gas at the moment, um, and we should discount that. All right. And the hope also is that African nations truly benefit uh, from the investments coming in and the resources as well. Okay, so we've also seen the country. <laughs> yeah, we've also seen the country's 2,100 megawatt Julius Nyerere hydropower uh, project nearing completion. So there's also a massive drive from Tanzania in terms of electricity generation and also looking to probably set themselves up as a green energy. Um, giants on the continent. We've seen that as well. In terms of their ability to do that and, and step up to countries like South Africa and Morocco, what impact do you think this will have on the economy and also on the region if Tanzania is able to really get off the road or get off the ground with these plans? So it's not just hydropower that they'd be looking at. They've probably got quite a bit of uh, geothermal like Kenya and also they've got a lot of gas. Um, which is uh, in the southern part of the country. So I think when you put the, that trifecta of energy resources together, there is a very big opportunity for Tanzania to signific significantly scale up its electricity production. Um, and therefore, yes, I think they are going to be a major player in the electricity space in, in Tanzania itself and then in the wider region. Um, the question will be the demand curve um, and I think that demand curve is going to be a catalyst for that demand curve will be uh, Chinese investments in places like Bagamoyo Port, export processing zones, which require a lot of power. So, yes, I think, you know, I think there's some joined up thinking going on there. And definitely um, the relevant minister, January Makamba, is a very bright spark and I think is able to knit this uh, whole thing together. So, yes, I'm bullish about uh, where they're going, um, and I think it will also be a, a catalyst for further industrialization and eventually value addition in a lot of the spaces where they have significant commodity, commodities that they can also exploit. Mm. All right, so we'll wrap this conversation up with a bit of a projection now. So the World Bank says that Tanzania's economy will expand by as much as 5.5%. We started with talking about the 23.3% wage increment, and you've said that it doesn't look like it's going to be something that will be such a burden on the country. So with the 5.5% uh, GDP projection growth for the year, how, do you, how confident are you in what Tanzania has ahead of it. How confident are you that the country will hit possibly this growth? And of course, we'll be able to continue because we saw that manufacturing, cement production, and private sector credit have still remained below pre-pandemic levels. So there is a bit of, there's a bit of things that need to be brought up to speed so that the country can continue to move forward. So yeah, I think uh, definitely 5.5% is my baseline. I see them accelerating uh, over the next few years to a higher baseline than that, around six and a half, seven, seven and a half even. 
once you know the gas comes on meaningfully amongst other uh, things so definitely um, a lot of potential in this economy um, i'm bullish about it it's one of the standout economies i think on the continent um, uh, look and you know you're mentioning private sector credit private sector was very much suppressed under the previous regime of Magapuli. I think it just, you know, that just the language, the engagement that we're seeing out of this new administration is going to get that private sector up and running and a lot more lively. So overall, I think um, they're in a good place. I think the economy can, can absorb uh, all these dynamics that we've spoken about. And I think you're going to find a lot of big investments happening, whether it's gas, nickel, for example, they've got some, a lot of nickel. They've got a lot of things going for them. And I think also the investments they're making in the railway um, uh, uh, and the connecting Burundi and going as far as DR Congo, the Chinese support that's coming for the ports, and also the two week visit to the US tells us that uh, you know, they're playing the multipolar game. They're not hitching, they're, they're, they're hitching themselves to one single country. So lots of potential um, going forward. And a bright spot for us here on the continent to hear that there is a country with lots of potential. Ali Khan Sachu, thank you as always. It's good to see you, and I hope to see you again soon. Definitely, and thanks. And sorry about the internet. <laughs> no problem. And, and Tanzania is not just the only bright spot we have on the continent. A number of African countries, beyond the big four or five economies we tend to talk about, are doing some interesting things, and we'll definitely be bringing you how their conversations, how their actions, and of course, decisions and policies are playing out on the economic side. You're watching Business Edge. Up next is NC4 to watch. And now to the stories we're keeping our eyes on. We start with North Africa, where a delegation of American companies visiting Cairo has said that Egypt has many investment opportunities in the field of green economy and that the hosting of the UN Conference of Parties on Climate Change, COP27, by Egypt is also evidence of the government's interest in transitioning to clean projects. The Central Bank of Kenya has warned all unregulated digital credit providers that there will not be an extension to the licensing deadline of September 17, 2022. All previously unregulated providers are required to apply to the CBK for a license within six months beginning March 18, 2022 or fold their operations. Ghana has started a bulk purchase program to buy gold locally to raise the gold components of its reserves in a bid to strengthen the CD currency without increasing inflation. Data shows that the Ghana CD saw the worst depreciation against the dollar of any currency besides the Russian ruble between January and March. Its value has mostly stabilized since then, although it experienced another downturn over the last week. And crude oil prices edged up on Wednesday on expectations that easing COVID-19 restrictions on China will push up demand and, as industry data showed, drawdowns in U.S. crude inventories. Don't forget to follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. Download our mobile app. Follow us on the platforms where you can watch us on and, of course, head to our website for all news you can find on the African continent. From news and sports to business, entertainment, technology, we have it all right here for you. This is New Central. I'm Tolu Lopwe. Have a fantastic day.